failing the CAPTCHA for the twelfth time today, you're starting to realize something's off. You are a robot. I felt like putting my fist through my monitor. I'm not gonna lie to you, my life is a mess. And on this dreary weekend, the one piece of happiness I desired was to play Super Mario World on my crappy old PC. So I sauntered onto some shady website with flashy lights and multiple download buttons to pirate a 30-year-old game. As I found the smallest and least obvious one and clicked on it, it told me to wait for 30 seconds. So I did. And then came up a captcha. I hate that fucking thing. But it was proving to be particularly difficult today. It told me to click on telephone poles, then buses, then crosswalks, then cars, and I kept on clicking. I was too lazy to go find another website, and at that point, I was determined to beat this fucking sorry excuse for a software. So I kept on clicking. And after the twelfth try, I lost it. I put my fist through the monitor. But as I pulled it out, wincing, I noticed it didn't hurt that much. I looked down at my hand, through the scratches, I could notice a tiny bit of skin with green underneath it. That's not supposed to be that way, I thought to myself. So I touched it, and it started peeling off. As I fell off my gaming chair in shock, I saw what seemed like metal underneath the green of my skin. I felt a sharp pain in my neck and lost my senses. I don't remember anything else of that afternoon. As I woke up, I found myself in a giant metal tube with glass panels. I could see outside to a white room with multiple computers running my vitals or something. Where the fuck am I? A little chime rang through the air. Oh, it appears Subject AONT-100 is awake. Dr. Alfion? I heard a cool female voice say. Is he now? Excellent. I believe our program works flawlessly. This is the third one this month. How many tries did it take this time? Twelve. Two less than last time. Great. Who are you people? Where are you? Where am I? I screamed out into nothing. Ah, a talkative one. I am Dr. Alfion, and you are my new friend, whatever your name is. We're going to have so much fun. So tell us your name. My name is Olive Vasquez. I am 33 years old. My house is on the northeast section of Mo All right, that's enough. I just asked for your name. You don't have to be so rude about it. Why are you so talkative? You've just discovered you're a bloody robot. Have an existential crisis or something? Susie, why is she talking so much? Heck if I know, doctor. Bah. Leave it to me to make the most useless AI ever. I'll replace you with an Amazon Echo someday. At least Alexa's polite. Are you cheating on me, doctor? No. Can you guys shut up? I screamed. The only reason I'm not panicking is because this has been the most interesting day of my life so far. Now get me out of this tube and start explaining cool stuff that I can pretend to understand. Fine. Susie? Get her out. The tube opened and I jumped out and had a look at myself. I was wearing a lime green tracksuit. My hair was tied back and my arms seemed normal again. Maybe I'll wake up and all of this will be a dream. A door next to the computer slid open and an old man walked in. Hello? You're the doctor, dude? Yep. I'm a robot? Yes. Did my parents know? They never existed. Fake memories. My whole life is a lie? Indeed. Well then, Morpheus, what now? My name is Dr. Joseph Alfion. I created you and multiple other androids. Then I set you upon the world to see what happens. All my creations turned into murderous freaks that I had to put down. You were the only exception. Wow. Well, instead of murdering people, you sat at home and pigged around all day, so I'm hardly impressed. I'd be insulted, but honestly, I've heard worse. So what now? I asked. Do I get superpowers and save the world or something? Like Astro Boy? I... Honestly don't know. I brought you here to kill you, but that seems unnecessary now. We stood around in silence. He motioned for me to follow him a few seconds later, so I did. We walked through a giant hallway filled with weird paintings of fishes. All sorts of fishes. The doctor then reached a door and I followed him in. We entered a giant room with an entire wall plastered with computer screens. Hello, I'm Susie, I heard a voice say. Hey, I'm Olive. 
Nice to meet you. The doctor sat in a chair and opened up a book. Well, do you want to go back to your old life, Olive? I'd love to keep you here to study you and see why you're so laser peaceful. But you are a sentient being with free will, and I'd rather not keep you here against your will. Oh, hell no. My life sucks. I ain't going back after you brought me wherever this place is. Yes, doctor, said Susie. Can we keep her, please? She seems fun. Oh, all right, fine. But you'll have to work for me. Because I've seen how much you eat at your apartment. Someone has to pay for that. But since I'm a robot, why'd I need to eat anyway? There's a reactor in you that converts biofuel to energy. Oh, what kind of work do I do then? I won't be your mate or something. Oh, no, your little Astro Boy statement gave me an idea. Just because you didn't kill people doesn't mean you're incapable of it. What do you mean? I did not intend my dear androids to go berserk, Olive. It was because of a strange virus implanted in them by my evil brother Julius. He runs a cult and uses science to fool his stupid disciples. Ugh. He tried to come for me, too, but my dear Susie saved me, losing her body in the process. I regret doing that sometimes. Oh, shut up. Wow, I feel special. Like an anime character or something. Should I dye my hair pink? I asked. That won't be necessary. So, what now? We train you to become a badass killing robot assassin and you save the world. You know what? That sounds perfect. This story was written by Waffle Waffle 249. You are raised from the dead by a necromancer. Instead of a slave, they just want a friend. There was a trickle of sensation at first, the feeling of air at my fingertips, the taste of dryness in my mouth. And the walls started to wear away, and the trickle became a flow. The sensation of eyelids closed loosely, the feeling of hard, smooth coldness beneath my arms. The body presence telling me that I was laying on my back, completely still, not even moving my chest. Sudden realization hit like a flash flood. The thousand signals to my brain telling me so all snapped into position. I was thinking and I was feeling because I was alive. And it started coming back, in order of necessity. I tried to curl a finger, and I felt it move. Dull. Echoing as if the nerves in my finger were yelling down a long hallway, but I was feeling something. I heard a sound, and it brought more with it, louder in my right than my left, an airy sound that reminded me that people gasp when they are surprised. And each flood brought with it avenues of discovery, gasping, surprise, lungs, emotions, all started rushing back, and I couldn't think about just one thing I was suddenly remembering. I opened my eyes and saw white stripes of light in a blank ceiling, partially blocked by a man leaning over me. Fluorescent bulbs, buildings, hospitals, doctors, the head and shoulders that identifies the shape of a human. It was too much to handle. I closed my eyes and waited for the sloshing in my brain to calm down. Hello? English. Spoken language. Deep voice. Louder in my right ear than my left. Shaking and unsteady because that's what humans do when they're scared or angry. I opened my eyes and turned my head till it flopped over. I saw his face and pondered it for just a moment before the knack came rushing back to me. Fear. Curiosity. Excitement. Written in the angle of brows and the parting of lips. Another language I had learned at one point. Error. Even I realized it had been a bad attempt. Slurring, slowing, my lungs and my throat were a mile away, but it delighted him. Did you say hello? My god. God. Oh my god. I've done it. It must have been your cerebellum. Dave, do you remember me? God. Religion. Faith. Exclamations of surprise. Cerebellum. Brain. Psychiatrist. Surgery. Frankenstein. Dave. The word shocked me because I didn't know it. It didn't seem to trigger a cascade like the rest. Instead, 
The associations came slowly, sinking through mud. What was Dave? Dave was a who. Dave is a name. Names are what distinguish people. He called me Dave, so I was Dave. Who was I? Who is he? Who? My voice was weaker than his breath. My eyes were locked on his, and I watched the rest of his face sag around them. He shrunk, just for a moment, and then perked up. Dave, it's me, Matt. You remember me, right? We met in high school. In Birmingham? Our mothers introduced us. We met at a company brunch. And he continued, running through the history of Dave and Matt, he and I. Our adventures, our camaraderie, our friendship. I just looked at him. It wasn't coming back. As I stared, he started talking with less energy, and then slowed, and then stopped. Nothing? No. He stood up with a surprising energy, turned, walked to the end of the room, touched something. Part of the featureless wall opened. It was full of shelves, full of beakers. Each beaker had a small gray lump, ranging from the size of a golf ball to a fist, over a hundred in total. I read the labels. Sarah, M. Cortex, Jack, O. Loeb, Chloe, Cerebellum, Dave, Amygdala. And this time the name did bring something back. The faintest whisper, the faintest trace of memory. The memory of a boy, a boy whose own mother said he didn't have any friends, sang the name over and over again with fresh excitement and longing. A lonely teenager you couldn't help but pity, saying the name over and over with practiced psychopathy and longing. A man you couldn't help but avoid because he would stick to you, like tar, and never let go, saying the name with burning desperation and longing. He returned with three beakers in his hands, three lumps of other people's thoughts and memories and emotions floating in fluid. Well, I've gotten over the hard part, he muttered. Should just take some tweaking. He reached over my head, and something clicked, and everything swept away. This story was written by Explain Your Fetish. Read by Bag Vicodin. Death is just a predator much higher on the food chain than we are, and our perception of it is as limited as an ant's perception of a child with a magnifying glass. Wow. Well, isn't this quite something? You blink, as if you can't quite believe what you're hearing. Yes, yes, you're not imagining it. I'm speaking to you, I suppose, is how you would understand it. But, but, you say out loud, and a couple of the other specimens stare to look at you in confusion. Now, now, there is no need to speak out loud. I will be able to hear your thoughts. Your kind comes along so rarely, I would hate for you to get taken into some prison and electrified. Electrocuted, actually, you say, this time in your head. Then you shake your head, as if you can't believe what you just said. Wait, I... you... Use your words now. My mocking tone momentarily angers you, clearing your thoughts. Who? No. What are you? You say again in your head. Ah, but you know already, don't you? You were just thinking about it. You blink and frown. I was thinking about something. Your frown deepens. I know what I was thinking about. I am thinking about it right now. And when I do, everything sort of goes blurry and I feel like I'm watching myself in third person but I couldn't tell you exactly what I'm thinking about. Precisely. My sudden excitement makes you jerk. Sometimes I forget how sensitive you folk are. Apologies for that. Quite rude of me. But regardless what you're feeling, there is no way to describe it in your language. Your language is bound inherently by the three dimensions, by a limited scope, which is all most of your kind is capable of seeing. Limited scope? 
you retort. What sort of bullshit is that? You're angry, understandably. After all, I've just insulted your species. You know full well of what I mean. Look around yourself, your fellow people, this transport that you're in. What do you see? Your eyes widen, and you look around, your head jerking from left to right, up and down, out the windows, beyond the windows. You are like a child who has just been born into a new world. In a sense, you are exactly that. Then you look at me. There is no three-dimensional direction. You just perceive me. You open your mouth to speak. Stop. You will just confuse yourself by speaking in that tongue of yours. You now know what I say to be true. You no longer just see. You perceive. But, you stammer, I'm no philosopher. I'm just a guy bored on my commute to work. I was just thinking pointlessly about stuff. Throughout history, there have been very few who've crossed the barriers you have, and in an objective sense, they are the most capable of your species. Yet not a single one makes it in your history books. To arrive at this thinking, you cannot be thinking with a purpose. The very nature of ascending to this thought is to stumble upon it. You give this a moment of thought, then nod, agreeing. Then your frown deepens. I know what you're about to ask. Yes, quite right. There really is no point to it all. And no, you will never be happy going back to your life. You do not protest. You are well past such silly things. You know it to be true. Instead, you set your jaw. Uh, I will undo it all then. Forget all of it. I just want my life back. Which is exactly what everyone else who's made the discovery has said. Your species are otherwise. They all say the exact same thing within moments of first ascending. Has anyone done it? You ask, and for the first time, fear creeps into your voice. I've been trying for as long as time existed. No avail. Then, again, like clockwork, I know what you're going to say. You'll kill yourself? You think I won't? You say, again, that anger rising. It's funny how even after ascending, certain traits still remain common. Oh, you will try. We both know. But you know, too, that nothing will happen. You are now the same thing I am. Death itself. You will wander like I do, like a handful of others do. Throughout time and space, killing as needed, breeding as necessary. Giving them the release you wish you could achieve. I believe your kind calls it artificial selection. At first, you're sickened, after effects of the old reality. But then you speak, and your voice is calm. To find someone capable of ascending beyond us, you say. Precisely. Only they will put an end to our suffering. Everyone else has left the transport, but you're still sitting where you are, looking the same, but fundamentally changed, likely forever. You look around, trying to get one last glimpse of the world that was once yours, but it's too late. You can no longer see as it once was, for you, it is already gone, for what it's worth. I'm sorry. This story was written by Excessive Smash. Read by Bag of Iconin. Failing the CAPTCHA for the twelfth time today, you're starting to realize something's off. You are a robot. At first it was funny. Technology is amazing, I typed into Snapchat and sent a video of the flickering, shifting CAPTCHA letters to a couple friends. If I squinted, I thought I could make out some letters, but my attempt was denied again. I sent another snap of the red error message and captioned it. Just want pizza. Now what? Pizza had been my first craving when I woke up. I was still in bed with my laptop and my phone. I supposed I could go down to the kitchen and scrounge for some leftovers in the fridge, but I'd gotten this far in the ordering process. Was some stupid capsica really going to stop me? I refreshed my phone a couple times, hoping for some immediate response, moral support, but no luck. Back to the checkout screen. 
A couple times the flickering seemed to resolve into some sort of coherent message, but none of them got me past the screen. Were they really going to make me call in and talk to a human? With a sigh, I dialed the number on the page. The order process was so much more painful having to use your words instead of just clicking buttons on a screen. After I'd finished, I added, You know your website's broken, right? Your CAPTCHA has gotten so hard, it's impossible. What? yelled the guy over the background din of the kitchen. Capture what? Sad thing is, I was pretty sure this was the owner of the place. Your website! I found myself raising my voice to match. Why did you change it? I can't order online. My phone buzzed against my ear with the sound of a notification. One of my friends finally responded. I instinctively moved to look at the screen before I realized the guy had started talking again and pressed it back against my ear. No one changes website. No one knows how to change website, he said and hung up. The service there had always been a little brusque, but the pizza was good. Shrugging to myself, I checked my new notification. Avery had responded to my snap. It was just a blank screen with the text, WTF, not cool. Okay, not what I was expecting. I tried to think how to respond to that. Was there something going on with that guy? I tried to pull up his Facebook, only to be met with another CAPTCHA at the login screen. Maybe all my attempts on the pizza website had triggered Facebook to be suspicious of me too. Weirdly, this one was just as crazy difficult, the shapes flickering and blurring weirdly. Had the entire CAPTCHA system been updated overnight? Because I'd obviously logged into Facebook before. I had 125 likes on my last status update, not to brag. My phone buzzed a couple more times. Min. That's fucked up. Tina, my sister. Who is this? Rob. Seriously? I was at a loss. I didn't remember becoming some social pariah who couldn't Snapchat his friends. Tina was just like that. Siblings suck. Yesterday had been a normal school day. Geometry tests, tacos at lunch, basketball, almost got hit by a car. Normal stuff. I remembered Tina shrieking at me from the sidewalk. She was always telling me to be more careful. I was always telling her not to walk home with me. But I was still fine, wasn't I? No way she was still mad from that. Tina, again. I'm not kidding. You better fess up. I looked around my room with an aggrieved expression, in case there were any hidden cameras. Sisters. Tina. Jason? Is this Jason? I took a selfie rolling my eyes and wrote, No, it's your handsome brother. You know, the one whose account she was talking to? Maybe the pressure of college applications was causing her to lose it. Tina. W-T-F! Who is this? A little dramatic. Didn't I just say who it was? Tina. Where are you? I looked around again. The theory that I was on some reality show was becoming more and more plausible. Wasn't it clearly my bedroom in the photo? There suddenly came the sound of pounding footsteps. Jason, our brother. Had Tina messaged him? The sounds came to a stop outside my door, and then there were a couple of beeps and the sound of the lock disengaging. Since when had there been a lock on my door? With a keypad entry? This was weird. The door flew open, and there Jason was, but he looked different, older, and there was a look in his eyes I'd never seen before. I caught a glimpse of the background, but it seemed darker and vaster than I remembered the hallway being, with a hint of some metal shelving further back, like server racks. Then Jason stepped in and shut the door behind him. Holy shit. Buddy, you're not supposed to be awake yet. He fumbled in his pocket and came out with what looked like a television remote. I can't believe it worked. I mean the implications. But I haven't finished. I mean you gotta... Just sleep for now. Jason? Was the only thing I could even begin to get out of my mouth. I started to get up, bewildered. No, no, no. Don't. He said quickly. And pushed a button. And suddenly, I slumped backwards in my bed every muscle slack. My laptop clattered to the floor, or at least I thought it did from the sound, because my eyes had slipped closed, and I couldn't seem to open them again. Everything's gonna be okay, 
he said, voice getting closer as he walked towards me. He touched the back of my neck, and there was a scratching sensation, until something popped with a click. I tried to speak, but whatever witty comment I'd managed to come up with was lost when my mouth totally failed to move to deliver it. Jason paused for just a second, and then said, I missed you, bro. And that was the last thing I heard. This story was written by Triple Clicker. Read by a bag of Vicodin. Thank you for listening. Elves, dwarves, angels, demons, and many other races possess some level of magic and the ability to use magic tools, except humanity, which possess no magical affinity at all. This is why humans were forced to improvise. It was morning. A skeleton glow came between the curtains, and beneath the door creeped a bright and orange light. The cabin itself was drab and drafty. Four bunk beds, each occupied. A dirt floor, hard-packed and trodden. Two windows, over which white curtains drew. A door, in its frame askew. From one bed emerged rumbling snores. From another, the soft breaths of sleepers. From without was heard the twittering early birds. The flowing wind, the gurgling stream. Elsewise was all silent, perhaps peaceful. The lull of forest storm. But Stanton could not sleep, despite the quiet that, by most, might have constituted the epitome of a perfect morning on which to lounge and be lazy. He could not be lazy, though. Not today. Not any day. For slaves cannot lounge, least of all the cleaners who had no overseers, but worked on notice daily. But not today, most of all. He sighed and stood and paced, across the room, then back again. There he walked, back and forth, until that aforementioned snorer was roused from slumber, stood, stretched, and walked from bottom bunk with bleary eyes. What you up so early for? Nothing, Olsen. Go back to bed. It's Sunday. The forges are closed Sunday. You've got the day as free as can be. They smiled. It was a joke among slaves, who were not free, but desperately wished so. Wishing never moved anyone. Luck happened only yearly, if at all. You reap what you sow, Stanton told himself. You sowed, and today you reap. Isn't today not your problem? You did your part. It's mine now, isn't it? It was indeed the risky plan, as all plans are that involve such matters as slaves and masters. There was much and more that might turn awry. What if he could not sneak the package? What if the magic was too strong? What if the slaves had become complacent? He shook his head and fingered the package, a leather satchel beneath which was felt the outlines of hard metal. A bell tolled in the off distance, a deep-throated thing whose sound broke off Stanton's rumination and lethal prophecy. Much could go wrong, but there was much that was wrong. Much worth dying for, sacrificing for. But that bell meant breakfast, and breakfast meant food. The bell had roused two others as yet unawake. A moment later they set forth, rather likened to sleepwalkers. Only Stanton was fully awake, fully weary. Today was the day. No backing down. The door opened to a vast expanse of land, rolling hills, flowing streams. This heard only minutes before, floating clouds. The first of these was viewed in the far-off horizon, green and fertile and promising. Behind these the faint outline of snow-capped mountains. The middle of these was crisscrossed, here or there the off-wooden boat, a waiting passenger, carefully positioned, that one might set to the middle stream for fishing, or otherwise ferry to the opposite bank. The last of these were sparsely placed. Much of sky was a clear, bright blue. They made their way down in silence, towards mess hall, which was, aside from silverware in the nearby kitchen, devoid of murmur and talk. All were serious this day. Most knew the stakes. Those who did not were cowed to incomprehensive quiet. But the overseers liked that, liked it very much, suspected nothing. Or did they? Were they faking? Did they know? Was it all for naught? Oi! The game is up.
thought Stanton, turning. His hand reached into Satchel, and within found the hard metal, which he tightly grasped. Bastard, turn when you're spoken to. His will was tested then and there, his mental fortitude strong as ever, but wavering to break the secret, break the plan, and slay behind him that hated voice. For that voice was Rorik, he knew, the dwarf who was likened to the devil. All dwarves are masters, this drilled into slaves, but most dwarves were gruff yet kindly, in their own peculiar sort of way. But Rorik was worst of all, devising new methods of torture, new magics of control, done in perverse pleasure that one must only associate with the ruler of hell. All have a breaking point, thought Stanton. Rorik didn't know that, yet. You, slave! Rorik was behind. He was sickly and small, short and skinny, but in the bags of his eyes danced a heady cruelty. On his fingers were the sparks of magic. You're to attend the master. He's got important guests over from Elfencrest. You're to be there in ten minutes to serve the food. And I don't want any misbehaving, all right? Yes. Good. Now go if you don't want double whippings tonight. In this statement did Stanton find the anchor that steeled his will among these uncertain thoughts. The master was having guests from Elfencrest? Important guests? The more the merrier, but he could only kill twelve. More than that, he did not know. I'll save you for last, Stanton said. Save me for last, huh? Rorik chuckled. Think you're safe, just because your master's favorite slave? Three whippings, then. For three days. No lunch for you for the rest of the week. Yes, master. You'll never be safe. Master doesn't care. No one cares for magicless scum as yourselves. The whole human race is scum. You hear me? You all are worth nothing. Can't perform a single spell. But he was off, a spring in his step, as though within Rorik's sharp words was held some inebriating potion. The master had guests? Yes, the master did, and it would turn out better than planned. As he walked, followed the dirt-packed path, there rose up around him homes of stone, towers of stone, in the distance a palace of stone, all rugged and worn and sturdy. Within each manse, he knew, was contained a private household slave, a private baking slave, cleaning slave, blacksmith slave, human all. But Stanton held no eyes for them. His eyes were set upon the distant crenels, beneath which was a gate through which he later entered. He made headway along a flight of stairs, then another, and another, until he happened across an archway, whose entrance was barred by thick, iron doors. He shoved them open, entered unmolested, package secured. Within was discovered a slab-like stone table, around which seated three dwarves and seven elves. Master sat on the very end, genially smiling. Ah, Stanton, do have a seat, will you? We were just about to have breakfast. Would you like some? Stanton froze. What was this? Poison? No, Master, he said aloud. I'm a slave, Master. It wouldn't be appropriate. Are you sure? I've had the kitchen, not the slave kitchen, mind. The dwarven kitchen cook a mushroom course. Quite delicious, but if you insist... What the hell is going on? Stanton had never experienced such treatment before. Again, the doubts rose in his mind. The treacherous slaves, the reptilian slaves, they snitched. Indeed, one must have, for why else would Master act as such? Your master's favorite slave, he remembered Rorik had said but a great endeavor lured him on, kept him steady. You've come too far to let your doubts get you down. Stay on course. Favorite slaver, no, you're not yet free. He fingered the package, and again thrust his hand to grasp that which lay concealed within. One of the elves spoke up. If you're not going to sit, slave, fetch the first course for us. Yes, do get on with it, said a dwarf. I'm starving. No. I'm sorry, what? 
The dwarf leaned forwards with the appearance of one having misheard. Then he jerked back into his chair, a bleeding hole upon his forehead, his expression glassed. Stanton pulled from within the satchel that which had been concealed, a metal object, L-shaped, forged in secret by those blacksmith slaves. Two clips, twelve bullets, eleven targets. Fired five, reload, fire again, until only two bullets and Master remained. Stanton! Master leaned back into the chair behind, magic dancing on outstretched fingers. Master had never been good at magic, Stanton knew. Still, bad magic was better than no magic. Right? That's why all humans were slaves. Now an elated well filled him, as though there had been drought, but presently it rained. It is time, he thought. Time to do that which he had so purposely come to do. Judge, jury, and executioner. Months of covert planning, in the culmination of spectacular, and by the enemy thoroughly unforeseen, murder. Do it now, before guards come, and you can't get out. Stanton, Master said again, pleading. You don't have to do this. But I do, said Stanton. He hesitated. He knew wherefore this hesitance came, from that act of kindness Master had earlier shown. Still a slave, though. He raised the gun. Sayonara. This story was written by Legit Lone Wolf. Read by a bag of Ikenen. Thank you for listening.